Now, as we return to the first book of Kings and begin in this ninth chapter, we are reminded that the dedication of the temple, which has been built by King Solomon on commission from his father and in fulfillment of God's purpose for his people Israel, that building program is now fully complete. Every interior ornament has been set in place. Every particular functioning part of the ceremonies of worship have been secured. The Ark of the Covenant has been given primary position and the priests have been commissioned. So all is now ready for the temple to be handed over to the worship of the people in their worship of God. Now, if you come over into Second Chronicles chapter 7, uh, you will read in the, these verses a, a parallel passage that uh, develops uh, in some ways a better understanding of the detail of what has taken place here in First Kings chapter 8 and then into chapter 9. And uh, we want to just look uh, for the moment at verses 1 to 3. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 3. When Solomon had finished praying, that is, the prayer of dedication, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. So here we now know that in confirmation of the dedication of the temple in the prayer of King Solomon, God has now indicated, he has now revealed, his good pleasure. He is satisfied with the acceptable building and presentation of this work, which has been a part of his revealed program for his people. We might ask, how do the people know that God has accepted their work and their worship? Verse 1 of Second Chronicles 7 tells us, fire came down to consume the burnt offering. So this was not simply a display of a religious exercise. It was not just an appropriate ritual performed. But here was an acceptable offering, and God confirmed it with fire. You see also, in uh, the second verse, the glory of the Lord, which has come down in verse 1, now fills the house of the Lord. So this is not simply the house of the Lord being filled with worshippers, being filled with people. But now into their midst comes the cloud of the glory of God, the presence of God. We can fill the church with people. We can exercise religious programs. 
and know nothing of an acceptance by God. It is the fire and the cloud of God's glory that confirms the good pleasure of God in our worship. So here, having had the prayer of dedication, God now demonstrates his willingness to answer the prayers of his people and accept the people who have prayed. And he does that in this dramatic fashion. But we know fire would not always fall upon the offering. The worship, for example, at the altar would cease. And uh, when we get through to the end of this uh, book of Kings, we're going to discover how and why that all took place. Secondly, we note that uh, worship itself would not continue for ever in the temple because the temple would be gone. The temple would be desecrated and ultimately destroyed. So there would come a time when the fire would be gone and the glory would be gone. So if God is to remove these tangible things how will his people know that he still answers prayer? How do we know that God is still with us, even though we do not have these uh, to remind us of his presence and of his power? Well, back over to 1 Kings chapter 9, and in verses 1 to 3, you'll read there of how God makes himself known. It came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So, in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, God demonstrated that he has answered the prayers of his people by fire and by cloud. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, God has given assurance by and through his word, his promise. We've already noted that the fire will be gone, the cloud of glory will be gone, but the word of God abides forever. And as we read through scriptures, we discover time after time after time we are reminded that the Word of God, which is forever settled in heaven, set in heaven, not to be changed, not to be altered, that Word will stand for time and for eternity. So the assurance given to King Solomon and to the people is that the Word of God will become their guarantee, not the practice of the temple. So now the focus is no longer on the work 
of Solomon. All of those years of planning and preparing and building and then presenting the temple and the palaces and all the other buildings that were a part of this procedure, the focus is now no longer on the work of Solomon. The emphasis now, the focus is on the word of God. Uh, Come over with me to John chapter 14, and uh, we will see the confirmation from the lips of Jesus as he reminds you and I today of the value of uh, this thought. John's Gospel, chapter 14, and uh, we want to read verses 12, uh, 13, and 14. This is the uh, chapter where Jesus confronts his disciples with his departure. He recognizes that their heart is disturbed. They are somewhat confused. And as a result of not knowing what Jesus has meant in previous uh, occasions when he's spoken about his departure, his exodus from them, uh, they are now at the point where Grief is beginning to set in, and their heart has become, in the words of verse 1, troubled. And uh, so Jesus confirms the reason for his return to the Father. He has acknowledged that he will come back and receive them so that they may be with him forever. The assurance of his authority and power is confirmed in verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything Jesus said is true. Everything he has done is true. Then we have an issue, a problem. The disciples begin to query what he means and how he will effectively guarantee this word of promise and explanation. In verse 7, Jesus has uh, said to them, if you had known me, and and the word known there is emphatic, It's it's a really known me, probing, Uh, comment. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. So Philip comes up with the question, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Now here are the verses as as Jesus introduces this, uh, this theme. In verse 9, have I been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip. Now let's go down to verse 11. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I said to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my Father's in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He then continues to elaborate upon that comment. But you'll notice the context. The context is in the return of Christ after his work on Calvary is complete. When that work is acceptable to the Father, and he presents back to the Father's house to sit down at his right hand. 
In the meantime, until his return to take his people to be with himself forever, he is given this guarantee. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 14. Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. So here is the word of promise. The word that lasts forever. That cannot be altered, cannot be changed, cannot be diminished. Now come over into Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we begin to read at verse 14. Here is how the Apostle Paul takes up this theme. Now remember that Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name. Now here is the prayer of uh, the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition, of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off unto those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So, Paul explains how it is that the Word of God has superseded the work of the temple. How God now conveys His mind, His heart to His people through His Word. And by that word, we are encouraged, we are invited, we are welcomed to make our petitions known to God. Now we come over into chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 14 again. For this reason... I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I no longer go to an altar. I no longer am of the persuasion and opinion that God can only be sought and found in temple worship. But for the very fact that we have been placed into Christ, Christ now dwells in our heart. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Now notice his prayer. That Christ 
may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of God which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So here are the two petitions. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Verse 17. Verse 19. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now what happened after the prayer of Solomon for the dedication of the temple. The temple was filled with the fullness of God. The cloud came down to reside in the temple and fill the temple with glory. Paul now prays that you, not the temple, but that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Why? How? In what way? That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Remember John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. So this is the prayer. That the glory that is Christ will dwell in your heart. If Christ dwells in your heart, then your heart is filled with all the fullness of God. Now look at how uh, Paul continues. Uh, the reason why he is confident in praying this kind of prayer, asking for this to take place in the hearts of God's people. Look at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice the comment, verse 20. Paul has prayed this prayer because he knows that God is able not only to answer the prayer, but to answer in abundance, above and beyond anything that we could ever ask. Now look at the reason for God answering this prayer. Verse 21. To him be glory in the church. God is glorified in the church when his people are filled with all the fullness of God. Now back over in 1 Kings chapter 9 and uh, verse 3, God acknowledges to King Solomon that he has heard his prayer. His prayer is answered. Now we ask in what way uh, and how is this prayer answered? Let me just take a moment or two to take you through just one or two salient points from the prayer. We go back into chapter 8. First uh, Kings chapter 8. And these are some subtle observations, but very relevant and important. First Kings 8, let's read verse 28 and 29. Here's the prayer of Solomon. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, 
and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today. That your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day, toward the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. Note the prayer. Verse 29, the first part. That your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day. Now come back over to 1 Kings 9 and verse 3. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. Now note, my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. What had Solomon asked for? that your eyes may be toward the temple. How does God respond? My eyes and my heart will be towards the temple. You see, God answers prayer above and beyond what we ask for. Now let's uh, go a little more into, into this uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 again. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 25 and uh, 26. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, only if your sons take heed to their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. 1 Kings 9, verses 4 and 5, we have the answer. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Confirmation that not only would he provide what David had requested or petitioned God for, but he would multiply that blessing and benefit to Solomon in abundance. While God promises uh, these uh, promises to his people of Old Testament times, we know that everyone is reflected in the teaching of the New Testament. We ask for God's presence to be with us in various circumstances and situations of our lives. And how does God respond? We pray, Lord, be with me in this. And the answer comes, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. As uh, David is promised, so also is Solomon. Now, just as we bring this to a conclusion, um, come with me to Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3. 
And the thought that accompanies uh, this this morning is, is one that I'm sure we are all very familiar with. Uh, and that is that one of the unique privileges of God's people as we read the Scriptures is that we are able to comprehend what is um, general in nature in terms of God's unfolding word, his revealed word, his continual promises to his people. What is revealed in general terms has built into it a very practical and specific application. In other words, we read a text of Scripture, we note its context, we see it as it was given. We can identify its application at that particular time. We can see how that text is then embedded into the framework of the continuing revelation of God. And here and there, it emerges as a continuing promise. And when you and I read that text, somehow it reaches out and touches our heart, and we can see that this is not simply God speaking through His people in Bible times, to His people of Bible times times, not only to the generations that have followed and have preceded us, but right down to our day, this very moment, this Word of God takes a life to touch our lives, and this Word is generated with spiritual energy to lift us in our faith to acknowledge the goodness and the gifts of God. Now look at Psalm 1, uh, for example. In this uh, psalm, we have a very clear definition and distinction between those who are the Lord's and those who are rebelling against Him and His will. You will see in verse 1 the line, is set and the scene unfolds. Blessed is the man. And then we come down to verse 4 and you'll see the very real cut-off point, as it were, and the introduction of the contrast. The ungodly are not so. So verses 1 to 3 represent the godly. Verses 4 to 6, the ungodly. Now here is what we read about the godly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So those in the category verses 1 to 3 ought to have nothing to do with those who are in the category listed in verses 4 to 6. So as far as you and I are concerned as the people of God, we must focus, concentrate our heart, our thoughts on these first three verses. Now, what does God say to us in this word? Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You and I can read the general nature of these promises, and yet we know that these apply personally to our own heart. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, having outlined the terrible condition and the 
catastrophic ending that is in sight for the nation of Israel, the prophet gives a warning as he rebukes them for their lack of knowledge of God and their unwillingness, their stubbornness of heart to walk in their own ways. Even the very donkey, he declares, knows who its master is. But the people of Israel do not seem to regard their master. Full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that cannot be bound up and nullified with ointment. And yet, in the midst of that comes the challenge. Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's a promise that though given by the prophet to the people of Judah in his time is a promise that you and I can lay hold on today. God calls us to consider not only the folly of our disobedience, the judgments and the guilt of our sin, but to recognize that there is a remedy. And if that remedy is to be found, we must come to Jesus. Matthew 11, again, reminds us in the words of Jesus, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, God confirms His presence. He confirms His power. He confirms His purpose through His Word. God confirms all of this as His people pray and seek His face and turn from their wicked ways, God gives the assurance that as we pray, He will answer abundantly. Let us pray. Loving Father, as we consider these thoughts this morning, we know that in the further reading of this chapter, they lay out a way of blessing, but also in contrast to the way of God's curse. And we pray that you will help us to fully appreciate the means of our communication and communion with our Heavenly Father through Jesus. That we will not take this for granted, but having been driven to prayer, earnest and uh, sincere, seeking to know God's will and to perform it in our lives, that we will have the assurance that you are a God who answers prayer. Lest we unite our hearts in the worship of images and idols and bow down to false gods or to representations that we have made to place before the worship of God. Help us, Lord, to be truly honest with ourselves and in the experience of our heart. Help us to be like Solomon who prayed earnestly, sincerely, humbly, in order that the blessing of God would fall upon the people as they gather for worship. We pray that you will guide us so that we may
know in our own heart the blessing of the Lord. And as we gather for worship week by week, we will know the continued presence of God with us and your power established and displayed so that many will come to saving faith and your people will be strengthened in theirs. We desire that in and through it all, the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored and exalted. And in his name we pray. Amen.